this. So you, you should get started. Yeah, go ahead and go with your book. Well, hello and welcome to today's third day of the 2020 Louisiana Farm to School Conference. We are very excited that you're joining us again. And uh, today we have quite the exciting program for you. Uh, we have two sessions. One will cover education at home, a subject that has become a reality for a lot of students during the COVID-19 pandemic. And then later on today, we will also cover success stories around the state. Um, we are beginning today with a quick poll to see where people are from and just to break the ice a little. And uh, then just as a reminder as well, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please post these in the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. And then those questions will be forwarded to the speakers and answered after the presentation. And uh, if you look into the conference program, there should be a link in the chat. Uh, it's full of resources and anything you may need uh, to continue spread farm to school throughout the state. Great. We will start today with you, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I will end polling so everyone can see where everyone is watching from. It looks like the majority is from the southeast part of the state. Mm -hmm. um, here I'm sharing the results now. I want you to see it. And we have a good amount of variety here with how everyone is currently involved in front of school. So welcome. Great. All right. And with that, we'll get started with our first session. Hi everyone, my name is Johanna Freeler and I'm with the LSU Ag Center's Louisiana Farm to School program. I'm the program manager for Seeds to Success, which is our newest program. We just launched it and I'm really excited to talk to you all about the amazing educational resources that we have available on the website. And for Louisiana teachers, we have an opportunity um, for y'all to sign up for free gardening materials like the seed starting tray seeds and we also have larger classroom garden boxes so stay tuned for how you guys can sign up for those i'm going to hop right in and share my screen to walk through an informational overview of what the seeds to success program offers so like i mentioned this is under the louisiana farm to school program we're also collaborating with the department of education and the goal of this program is really to provide fun and engaging educational resources for teachers, parents, and students. And the great thing about this website and this program is that all of these gardening guides and lesson plans and activities can be done at school or at home, as we know a lot of students are learning virtually for this year. Seeds to Sow, it houses our comprehensive growing guides for fruit and vegetables that we recommend for Louisiana. Each guide and each crop will take you through seed to harvest in terms of selecting the right variety for our worst states and the conditions that you're growing in. It will tell you where, when, and how to plant as well as how to harvest and even recipes and taste tests for that product after the harvest. Seeds to know, this is especially important for teachers and parents who are teaching. This is where our lessons and fun activities are. This will be grouped by grade range and by crops, so you can really pair fun activities with what you're growing. And we made sure as well that these activities and lessons can really be done at the classroom or in the home. And lastly, careers and resources. Our career section is just going to identify a couple of really important gardening, agriculture, and nutrition careers for those who have a real passion for this line of work. And resources, this is what we hope to be a shared space um, organized by region where you can actually advertise a person, place, or event that is doing work with agriculture so that we can all be connected and help engage people who really want to be involved. And 
I'm going to show you the actual website next, but just so you know, you will be able to create an account at c2success.com where you'll be able to save specific growing guides for crops that you want to plant, as well as um, specific lesson plans and activities that you want to incorporate into your curriculum. And this is also where you'll be able to add those important agriculture resources to our resource page. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll also have an opportunity for Louisiana teachers to request those free growing materials. And that'll start off with the seed packets in 2021 and move into windowsill grow boxes and classroom container gardens. So now I'm going to hop right over to the website. You'll see that it kind of gives that overview that I was talking about. So you'll have an opportunity to head right to that seeds to grow, sow or no section. And then you can also, if you have a specific crop that you're interested in getting right to, you can click on that here. And as you see, we have 16 crops I recommend for Louisiana and we have guides written for them. And then as well, here are the lesson plans grouped by, the, by those age ranges. And then the resource page grouped by the five LSU Ag Center regions of the state. So let's start with the seeds to grow section. As I mentioned, I'll move my little bubble here. We have a bunch of getting started guides, gardening terms, those planting zones, and that planting guide map. So I recommend starting here. And then once you kind of get an idea of what you want to grow, seeds to sow is where we house those 16 crop guides. So we'll head over to the lettuce section and I'll show you everything that we kind of offer here. So as I mentioned, we'll start off with a little bit of a history. So this is also great for teachers who are incorporating specific crops into their lesson plans. This will give you a bit of a history that you can um, bring into the classroom, as well as talking about varieties of this different lettuce in this case. And then we have a table that will pop out with the recommended varieties for the state. We'll also walk you through when and how to plant lettuce um, and specifics on spacing and different things, as well as where to plant it and how to care for that plant. So things like watering, common insects um, that you'll face or diseases. We have a very helpful table here um, for you to do kind of a diagnosis on your garden. Find out by what symptoms, what, what could that be, and what um, organic and natural management practices are available for you. And lastly, we'll cover harvest and storage. How to harvest, we include links to um, different resources or videos to really help you understand the correct way to do this. And then we'll also include links to different recipes or taste testing ideas. So this is what you'll be able to find in the Seeds to Sow section. Seeds to Know section, let's go right into K through two. And you'll see as well, this is organized by um, that crop. So you'll see the crop list on the left-hand side, or you can just go right into the pop-out box. So let's head right on down to lettuce. And you'll see a list of lesson plans or activities. And each of them will kind of open in a pop-out box. And we have all of our lesson plans linked to the Louisiana student standards. So you can be sure that what you're teaching um, is really linked to those important standards that you want to reach in the classroom. We'll also include helpful videos to kind of bring that process to life in the classroom, as well as books that you can incorporate. So that is a summary of Seeds to Know section. And career paths, you'll see that we have identified a couple of areas. You can dig deeper into those if they're of interest, and then resources as well, which is where you'll be able to add to the specific region of the state and it will be grouped by parish. So please go in and add any people, places, and events related to local food, agriculture, farmers markets. Um, we'd love to have those added in. So I would recommend when you hop onto this website, you can do it now as you watch www.seeds2success.com. You wanna create an account. So I went ahead and logged onto my account so you'll see what this looks like. So here will be the 
place that teachers can put in a request for growing materials. This will be in 2021, but we encourage you to sign up now. And this will also show you where you've saved any of the curriculum and crop guides. So you'll see I have a couple saved here and I'll hop to one just so you can see what it would look like when you want to save one. Here I am in the seeds to sow section in the broccoli and cauliflower guide. And you'll see at the top here, you can do a bookmark for that guide. And that's when it will be saved in your account. Same with seeds to know when we are looking at a lesson plan that you wanna save, you'll also have a bookmark this lesson option right here and it will be added to your account. So that's just kind of a quick overview of the website. I encourage you to get on now, www.seedsuccess.com, create your account and start saving these really cool lesson plans and crop guides and get growing. I also wanna show you one last thing that we have as part of the project, which I think will also be really interactive and fun, is a Facebook group. So you'll be able to find our Seeds to Success Facebook group if you go to our Louisiana Farm to School program page and click on Groups, and there we are, Seeds to Success. Or you can also type in www.facebook.com slash groups slash Seeds to Success LA and you'll find this here. So we'd love for you to join the group and we're really hoping that this will be a place where we can interact and connect with Louisiana gardeners and teachers, parents, growers of all ages and really share tips and tricks for growing certain crops as well as um, lesson plans and activities that your kids found really engaging that you wanna share. Um, we also love to see recipes and resources to really bring the food from the seed all the way to your table and get those kiddos to really enjoy it. So that is an overview of the program. Um, I'll hop right back to that informational sheet, which again will be in our resources section of the program. I encourage you to share this. I encourage you to join the program, create an account, join the Facebook group, and share with all of your friends, family, teachers, we'd love to have everyone engage. And if you have any questions or want more information, you can just shoot us an email at louisianafarmtoschool at agcenter.lsu.edu. Get growing, everyone. Thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Mary Lagoria. I am one of the developers of the Louisiana Harvest of the Month Compendium. It is my pleasure today to do introduce you to the compendium. This is a current Harvest of the Month school year calendar. The commodities in orange are the most prevalent for each month. For example, summer squash is the most prevalent commodity in August, and eggplants are the most prevalent commodity in September. Today we're going to take a look at two lessons from the Harvest of the Month compendium. In the first lesson, Seed Sleuths, we will learn how to identify plant families with seeds. In the second lesson, Why is my eggplant turning brown? We will begin with an introduction to the origin and history of the eggplant. Students will then observe the browning of the eggplant slices and learn that this process is a chemical reaction called oxidation. Students then will engineer a process to inhibit the oxidation of their eggplant slices. Seed Sleuth. This lesson consists of one simple table which could easily be overlooked, but it's a powerful lesson about identifying plant families using only seeds. It addresses Louisiana's student standards for science, life science 3-1 for both first and third grades. These are the grades where students learn about heredity and inherited trait in both plants and animals. This past summer at the Louisiana School Garden Training, Dr. Kiki Fontenot, Dr. Pam Blanchard and I piloted this lesson with teachers. To set up the activity, we placed a few seeds from each vegetable on a plate with its fruit or seed package if the fruit was not available. Then the teachers seed sleuth examine the properties of the different vegetable seeds. They compared and contrast the properties to determine which vegetables were related. As they matched the seeds, they grouped the seeds together to form plant families. Many teachers were very surprised that peppers, tomatoes, and eggplants are in the same family, the nightshade family. But when you look at the seeds, it's pretty obvious. They're almost identical. 
Now it's your turn to be a seed sleuth. Look at the properties of each kind of seed in the top row. Then examine the seeds of the bottom row. Can you find the seeds that are related? Did you match the chard with the beet? That one was pretty easy. The next match is a cucumber with the squash seed, the scarlet runner bean and edinami are both in the lagoon family. They're both what we call beans. The last is a tomato and the eggplant. They go together. They are both a member of the nightshade family and their seeds are almost identical. Let's take a closer look at the seeds in the different plant families. For example, the chard family. We can see that the chard and the beet are very, very similar. But the spinach, which is the last one, is a little bit different. But it still has that hard seed coat. And if you look closer, you can see that there are those creases and ridges, just like the chard and the beet. In the next row, we have the uh, lagoon family. We have scarlet runner bee, beans, the edinami, and we have snap bean seeds. They all are beans, and our students should be pretty familiar with those. Most of those in the vegetables are edible. Okay, so next slide. Now that we have grouped the seeds together in their families, we can see the similarities. The cucumber, pumpkin, and squash have a similar shape, although they are different sizes and they have a very hard seed coat. The tomato plant, eggplant, and pepper have a tiny little disc-shaped seed, and the Brexilia family, the kale, the broccoli, and the mustard greens have little tiny spears in the different colors of orange and black and browns. A good extension to this lesson it would be to collect the leaves, flowers, and stems of these and other plant families and compare their unique properties. For example, if a plant has a square stem, it is a member of the mint family. After teaching this lesson, I think that looking at seeds is really the easiest way to identify the plant families. Vegetable plant family members. Here's a few more members of the plant families that we didn't look at. So here in the beet family, we see the, the spinach and the Swiss chard. The Brexilia family, we have broccoli, arugula, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, and a couple others. The carrot family includes the cilantro, dill, fennel, parsley, and parsnip. The cucumbers are the cucumbers, the melons, the pumpkins, and squash. The grass family has corn, but we know that our grains are also in the grass family, but in this chart, we're just looking at the vegetables. The lagoons include beets and peas, and the nightshade family is are the eggplants, pepper, potato, tomatillas, and the tomatoes. And then the onion family includes chives, garlic, leek, and shallot. The sunflower family includes artichokes, endive, lettuce, and tarragon. Why did my eggplant turn brown? This lesson focuses on the browning or oxidation of an eggplant when it is cut or bruised. Students will engineer a process to prevent eggplant browning. Then they will perform a controlled experiment to test their process to see if it inhibited the browning of the eggplant. Students should have prior knowledge of chemical and physical changes. This lesson addresses Louisiana student standard for science, physical science 1-4 for fifth grade. Teacher prep. The day before this lesson, you should purchase or collect from your home an apple, two large purple eggplants, a variety of eggplants, different liquids such as lemon juice, apple juice, milk, dry ingredients such as salt and flour, and a variety of wraps such as aluminum foil, plastic wrap. The teacher should cut a half inch slice off the bottom of one eggplant, peel the skin, cut off the slice, and leave it to be exposed to the air overnight. Wrap the rest of the eggplant in plastic and refrigerate it. Do the same for the apple. Day one of the lesson. Cut the eggplants into a half inch slices, two slices for each group of students, and immediately pass the slices to each group. 
Okay, if we look at our picture, both of these slices were cut from the same eggplant. The eggplant slice on the left has been exposed to the air and not refrigerated. The flesh shows signs of oxidation or browning. The eggplant slice on the right is a freshly cut slice. Day two, engineering a process to inhibit the oxidation of eggplant slices. Students will use this paper to step them through designing a process to prevent oxidation. Then they will treat one of their slices and the second one will be used as a, for comparison the next day to see if their process really worked. Day three, peer sharing. This is the most important day of the lesson. On this day, students will see their results of their treatment and ask themselves, did it work? They will use the untreated slice to compare the treated slice to see if the process of treatment inhibited oxidation. Then we will come together as a class, share our results, both the successes and the failure. The most important thing students learn is to see failure as part of the learning and design process. The scientists invented 409 failed 408 times before they finally succeeded in producing the ultimate cleaning formula. Students learn from other students' failures and successes how to improve their process. Then they try to their new process on a new eggplant slice. Day four, students check their second trial to see if they had better results. We take time to share our successes and failures and discuss what we learned about oxidation, chemical changes, and more important, how we learned that we really learned a lot more from failed attempts than if we had succeeded in the first attempt. Afterwards, we extend the lesson by looking at other everyday examples of oxidation like rust and copper patina. like the Statue of Liberty. Hello and welcome. Today, we will be sharing with you some Farm to School resources that can help you with your school and your classroom. I am Jen Duhon, a registered dietitian with Dairy Max. I work in both school marketing and the health and wellness program here in Louisiana, and I have experience that you can trust. As a registered dietitian, having worked in clinical management, public health, and most recently as a nutrition extension agent through the LSU Ag Center, you can say that I have a passion for connecting people with agriculture and where their food comes from. You can also say that I am an advocate because I love connecting people with understanding how important agriculture is to our everyday and future. Many of you are familiar with Dairy Max, but for those of you who aren't, I wanna share just a little bit Founded more than 40 years ago, Dairy Max is one of the leading regional dairy councils in America and an affiliate of the National Dairy Council. So simply put, Dairy Max is your local dairy council. We represent more than 900 dairy farming families and we serve communities in several states, including Louisiana. Our farmers work hard 365 days a year to feed millions with a truly nutritious food. Dairy Max is part of a nationwide effort to promote American agriculture and support dairy farming, as well as drive impact for every one of our dairy farmers. Our organization operates with five audience outreach programs, including business development, consumer marketing, health and wellness, industry image, and also school marketing. Today, I will share with you some of our resources that can help with your farm to school efforts. First, we have a great program called Adopt a Cow. So forget about the guinea pig. How about adopting a 1,500 pound dairy cow for your classroom mascot? And don't worry about having to find a pen to hold this animal. The photos and stories we'll send to you will make her life on the form 
come alive to your students within your classroom, both in person and virtually. So I want you guys to know that this program is completely free. There are no costs from beginning to end. There's no approval process as well. Once you complete and submit your enrollment form, your classroom will be registered. Registration for each academic year is August 1st to October 15th. So the deadline is coming up. And let it be known that no information will be sent out until the calves are born and registration has closed, which should be around November. Hoping that many of you are back in your classrooms by this point, or at least teaching hybrid so that you can have a little bit more interaction with your students. So timeline of events. Within November, you should receive an introductory video sent via email and a kit with details about how to host a form and CAF presentation. In January and March, you will receive updates. And in April and May, you will have an opportunity to live chat with your CAF and a host via YouTube. A little bit of information on eligibility. Almost everyone is eligible to participate. You need to be either teaching in a traditional classroom setting, hosting through homeschooling or virtual. This can be run through an after school program or even facilitated through your library program. You can also have an agriculture program within a museum or kids center. And you can do this from within the United States and even share with your friends outside of the United States. So throughout the program, you'll find out what your cow's name is, what's their birth date, and where they live, and how the former actually takes care of them. You'll also get photos of the cow, activity sheets for your students, and a full PowerPoint of information with photos and suggested lessons that follow Common Core standards. We also encourage classes to fully engage in this program and even write letters to their calf and the form family not only to practice your writing skills, but also to show the love for your calf. In the end, we'll keep you posted in her progress while you and your students enjoy the cuteness of your adorable calf. The Adopt a Cow program is just one of the many programs that is offered through Dairy Discovery. Now I wanna move on to fuel up to play 60. Again, Several of you are probably familiar with this amazing program that is sponsored by National Dairy Council in coordination with the NFL and the USDA. You Look to Play 60 is a free science-based youth wellness program that creates real change in your students' health, as well as increasing their leadership and academic performance. This is the largest in-school wellness program in the country. And due to its flexibility, it is adaptable for distant and hybrid learning. Fuel Up to Play 60 is easy to execute and fun for your students. Through digital resources, Fuel Up to Play 60 offers a variety of monthly fun facts, meal planning information for parents, and links to find out where food comes from. This can include virtual tours, digital handouts, and fun experiments. Also, My Plate Tips, Parents Guide to Active Activities and Lifestyles, and a Fuel Up to Play 60 training camp video. The list goes on and on. And new this year is the Fuel Up to Play 60 Homeroom, which is designed to help with virtual learning. This is the hub where any program advisors, teachers, anyone, any adult who wants to be able to get a little bit more information and easy to understand how Fuel Up to Play 60 can work for you, both virtually and hybrid. It can be found here at the Fuel Up to Play 60 homeroom. And Dairy Max has a new curriculum of Farm to School, which goes hand in hand with Fuel Up to Play 60. While developing the curriculum, it was vital and that we align Fuel Up to Play 60 within this curriculum as a vehicle for students to learn about health and fitness, which also supports science, health and PE, and meets curriculum standards. Sustainable nutrition was another focus, showcasing how farmers protect the land and the waterways and strive to leave it in better condition for the next generation. We have several modules and lesson plans that you will be able to go through. 
This also helps focus on what farmers hard work helps produce good food for all of us to eat, as well as what farmers do to care about the land and animals. With the four lesson plans, you will get legendary cows. This lesson teaches how a farm operates and talks about sustainability as well and goes through the different breeds of cows. Then there'll be farm to fridge, which provides an overview of the journey of milk from farm to fridge, how it's produced, its freshness and simplicity, and the story that helps connect milk with the local dairy farm families. Staying healthy with milk. This is a hands-on learning with worksheets, videos, and students will get to learn why milk is an important part of your daily diet. Through the swirling of milk dairy science activities, students will be able to see how vitamins and minerals and proteins interact within milk. And lastly, students will also learn how dairy farms are a true model of sustainability by viewing the Dairy Max Stewards of the Land videos. Brain food. In this unit, students will review the importance of brain food. Collectively, students will discuss healthy eating options and the importance of dairy foods and MyPlate recommendations through the USDA. And throughout the curriculum, teachers will get great resources, such as the two-page teacher overview, which will contain all the links and suggested timing for these lessons. And it's important to note, while this curriculum standards are marked for K through third grade, many of these resources can be used for almost any grade level. In addition, digitally, the teacher will have access to the dairy science activities as mentioned, as well as fun and educational activities. And lastly, connections to Fuel Up to Play 60 and how the Farm to School curriculum can fit into your Fuel Up to Play 60 plan. The targeted release date is between October 5th and October 12th, and the link will be provided to you guys in the resource section. So let's talk a little bit about next steps of what you can do. Again, I wanna encourage you to sign up for fueluptoplay60.com. Get your school signed up. You can work with a small group of students within your school, a specific grade level, or open it up to your entire school to help participate. You can still log in and review the steps and plays as many of you were used to doing. And I really encourage you to work with me one-on-one -on -one if you need any help with working through any of these resources we provided to you today. Dairy Max is committed. We are committed to students' health and nutrition and really engaging and understanding where food comes from. It's one of the most important things that we can do to teach our students. You have my email here and I encourage you to reach out. I will be glad to help you guys. Thanks so much and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Good morning, Denise e. Mel with the Fast Food Farm. The Fast Food Farm is located in Gramercy. The contact information is listed on the first slide. The Fast Food Farm has many hands-on activities we normally do at the farm. So when the pandemic hit, we pivoted to drive-through activities in phase two and grab and go activities. On this slide is the list of the activities that are available in this presentation. The activities listed are recycling seed pots, my little sprout house, sprouting fingers, grow gardens, mini greenhouse, and what's in my lunchbox. These activities are also available in classroom kits for a small fee. Please contact me for more information. On this next slide, you will be able to click on some of the images for access to the activity. First example, click on the little red house frame on the left and the cardboard house to use an activity will pop up. Then click on the red house frame on the right and the activity will pop up. Next example, click on the vegetable plots 
the right plot will pop up the grow garden activity. The center plot will pop up the cover picture for the lid. And the plot on the left will pop up a video to show how it is done. You will be able to click on the two greenhouses, the gardener, the potted plants, and three lunch boxes to access more activities. The next slide is to talk about the three organizations who have many links for resources for use to teachers. Uh, I have gone through and selected some geared to the Farm to School. The three organizations are American Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture, National Ag in the Classroom, and Louisiana Ag in the Classroom. And as I said, there are many resources available through these organizations. The first organization is American Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture. The first link on this slide is the website link where you can get free resources. AFBFA has done a great job pivoting to providing at-home activities. You can also follow American Farm Bureau Foundation's Facebook page or the Fast Food Farms Facebook page for the update on those at-home activities. Just last week, the foundation posted an at-home activity. How did that get in my lunchbox? If you go to that post, you will be able to watch the how did that get into my lunchbox book being read online, as well as do an activity and play a game. That book also connects to the activity that is available on the Google slide with the fast food form activities. The next link is on the form STEM, where you can get resources on beef, plus others. The projects link is where you will find the My American Farm app. The My American Farm is an educational game platform used to engage pre-K through fifth grade learners. The free site offers agriculturally themed games and more than 100 educator resources. The next link is the Purple Plow, Plow Challenge. It's STEM learning, which encourages students grades fifth through 12th to research scenarios related to food, hunger and sustainability, and build their own prototypes to the defined problem. The current challenge is go with the flow. How can we improve the quality of our runoff and in turn reduce dead zones in our water resources? You can find also find past purple plow challenges on this site to do as a classroom challenge. The next two links are opportunities to apply for grants and scholarships. The next slide is the National Agriculture in the Classroom. The first link is the website. The next link is the curriculum matrix. The matrix is an online searchable topic and subject and standard-based curriculum map for kindergarten through 12th grade teachers. After you find what you need, consider storing them in your personal binder, my binder. The best part of the binder 
is that when a lesson is updated, it is also updated in my binder. Along with the lessons are companion resources that come in forms of the book, activity, kits, etc. Many of the activities I do at the farm is adapted from companion resources. The next link is e-learning resources recently added to the site. And next, you're able to resource state ag facts as well as state ag programs. And next is agro world. Under this link, the, on the slide is food and nutrition. And I pulled themes for learning for grades kindergarten through 10th that may interest you. As you look on this slide, there are many different um, activities, lessons that you can connect to in the themes of uh, both elementary, middle school, and high school levels. And at the bottom of this slide, there is also grant and scholarship opportunities. The next slide is Louisiana Ag in the Classroom. The first link is the website. The next link brings you to a list of commodities of our state. It gives you information about each top commodity. Next is our new commodity map that is now interactive, where you can click on that commodity and get the information about it. And next links are the lesson plans and make and takes. And on those lesson plans and make and takes, there are many, many of them. And many of those also connect back to the National Ag in the Classroom lesson plans as well. And last are the opportunities for teachers to apply for the Teacher of the Year. As I close this presentation, I would like to share with you this quote from Ben Franklin that hangs on the wall in our kids' kitchen at the fast food farm. Tell me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. Involve me and I learn. Thank you. Okay, I think that we're back. Here we go, stop sharing. All right, so now we are back for Q&A with our speakers. And we have a poll going now um, that you're welcome to answer, um, asking about which vegetable are you most interested in growing. And we also have our speakers, Jen is joining us, Mary. Yeah. So we're going to have everybody muted aside from who is um, asking and answering questions right now. So we're looking for uh, Jen Duhon and Mary Ligoria, Denise Email. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Hodson has some questions as well. And just a reminder, um, we do have a poll that just got launched too for um, which vegetables are you most interested in growing with kids? So take a second to answer that while we go through the Q&A. Um, one of the top questions we had was, are these resources free? Do I need to be a member of some sort to get these resources? So I think that's to all panelists. Denise, do you want to start since, since you answered it in the Q&A? Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, everything that I have presented uh, is free from the fast food farm. Um, we even put the, the kids together, the, uh, uh, providing all the supplies for a small fee, but to give that information, that whole lesson, that whole companion resource is free. Uh, and through the uh, organizations that are also put up there as resources, many of those are free. 
They also have kits that are provided um, that's all put together for the teachers to make it more convenient as well. But most all lesson plans are free. Um, since I did that video, both the American um, Farm Bureau uh, Foundation for Agriculture, as well as the National Ag in the Classroom has uh, updated their websites and made it even more user-friendly and for at home as well as at school. Um, Jen, what about your resources? Yes, all of our resources are free. And if you are in the program, the conference program, and you go to each of us that just presented, um, all of the headings are live links as well. So they will get you to exactly where you need to be website-wise for both the Adopt the Cow, Fuel Ups Play 60, um, our Form to School curriculum, as well as our website and our recipe resources. Great. All right, and Mary, what about the resources that you shared? Okay. They're all available on the Seeds to, on the, uh, the Harvest of the Month site, and some of them on the Seeds to Know also. Yeah, exactly. We have a little bit of an overlap, and you can see some of her, her lessons also on the Seeds to Success website. And all the resources on there are also free, and then Louisiana teachers can um, sign up for the free gardening materials on that site as well, creating an account. Did you want to go over our poll or ask another question? Sure. So I just shared the results from, from the poll and it looks like leafy greens are everyone's favorite for what they're interested in growing. And that will actually be one of the seeds that, that we'll send out with the Seeds to Success website. So that's great news for us. Um, we also had a question come in for Jen um, about how would someone get involved in adopting a cow? Where should they go? So I just linked the website um, here in our, our chat, but it's discoverdairy.com and then slash adopt a cow. But it's also if you go to our resources in the conference guide, that link will take you directly there. So just hover over the title adopt a cow and it'll bring you directly to that website. And is that in our, um, is that in our program as well under the resources? Great. Okay, great. So it can also be found in our conference program. Uh, Dr. Hudson, do you have any questions for our speakers? Uh, I, first off, I want to ask, in fact, what I enjoy so much about all of the presentations, it involves a lot of hands-on activities. And in talking to parents who are trying to help their, their children at home, they're looking for things that are away from a computer screen so many of the materials that are sent from the schools are virtual then of course they have to be done online but so many of the things that our speakers talked about do involve some things that will get them away from that computer screen and maybe do some more hands-on activities for mary i have a question now to um, access the harvest of the month material uh, someone does have to register and it can uh, it's also available to parents they can also participate Yes, uh, they could just merely go to the site and register. Is that how they access the material? Uh, Joanna might know. Do they have to register, Joanna? You can download the compendium with those lessons right off of the website. You can register if you actually want the printed materials. And Crystal is also looking to jump in and add anything Good. Yeah, to that. Good. Yeah, understand that. Yeah, now, many of the lessons, like uh, if you go to the Ag in the Classroom lessons, you do have to register, but everything is free. We made sure of that. And you don't have to be a teacher. It can be anyone. Anyone. And, and where do you go to register? The Harvest of the Bud site? Yes, on the LSU Ag Center. And we have that linked in the resources page and should also be in the chat. Yeah. There's a whole Harvest of the Month uh, part of our website. You can find all kinds of resources there and where to sign up and more information, as well as um, procurement resources that we went over last week with Crystal. Um, guides for the cafeteria, guides for the producer. We have all different aspects of it there in all of our materials and resources. But we only have about five minutes left before we're gonna go to a break. So um, if there's any anything that our speakers wanna add as far as maybe something you didn't get to say in your video or talking about you know educational resources during COVID, feel free to, uh, to step in. We don't have that many other Q and A's. Okay, I have something to say. Um, the, um, 
Deceits to Know and the Compendium have both have a lot of videos that we took a lot of time looking for because I mean with teachers um, it takes time to look for all those resources and some and really right now they're really stressed they don't have much time so and parents too so that they we found really good resources that were age appropriate and interesting not you know it's, it's kind of, a lot of times you get on there and they're kind of boring <laughs> these are really good resources and they really need you know to be looked at don't overlook that so that's thank you <laughs> yeah and, and thank you to our speakers we really enjoyed looking through all the resources that you guys have available and mary i really i liked that you you did one of the one of the activities we were sitting here all staring at our screen like trying to match the seeds and everything it's very i'm like i'm trying to get them away from the computers <laughs> and you can do it like that you know so yeah Maybe just go buy a few seed packets instead, put them all on the table and try and do it instead of uh, on the computer. Yeah, or cut the fruit itself, you know, pull out the seeds. There you go, okay. true. And then you have something to eat too. <laughs> That's what you want to get them to do. All right, uh, do we have any other questions? Maybe from, let's see, we usually have Kathy around too. <laughs> yeah. This is the time for our uh, attendees to put into the Q&A. Um, but the, the amazing free resources. I'm really excited about this. And for all the parents that are at home too, trying to find something to do, this isn't just for teachers to use, but an activity for you to do after school or on the weekends, a way to get involved with, you know, kids of all ages and have them get more involved with their food. Um, Ms. Denny, are you still doing uh, field trips right now or anything like that? I have, but however, most uh, schools cannot take field trips uh, right now, like small groups, um, different schools, like with small numbers, will have booked some for the future. Um, but that's why I've been doing these grab and goes and making offers that I'll put these together and get it to them. Like we can't even have our ag day this year because of the pandemic. So we are now doing backpacks for every uh, second and third grade student in St. James Parish. So I could do like items of such to surrounding parishes and whatever, but we're, we're getting together right now for the end of October to do such things. And it's, uh, we just feel there's such a need, like Pam had brought up, I think earlier about the, the parents and everyone being so stressed out about everyone constantly being before the computer. We just trying to connect to some of those lesson plans that they're dealing with virtually to put this hands on method into before the teachers, the parents, everyone. And I'll so gladly help anyone. If they just contact me, I'll do whatever just to send them the whole little lesson plan, like they will see what's all listed on it with what they need, what they have to do, everything's filled out for them and as go as far as putting the kit together for them. Great, thank you, Denny. I just wanted to say also that this education session, although this was really, really needed for people that are learning at home and for teachers that need more farm to school resources, this was our opportunity to take our exhibitors from our conference, which we have a whole floor of, and put them into a session so that we can put all of these resources together. So when you're flipping through your program, you'll see that this education session takes up, you know, the bulk of, of the pages there because we have so many resources we wanted to share with everybody from our fantastic uh, exhibitors reaching out to all of them um did we have another question we wanted to ask about the the difference between um how might this how might you use these resources at home versus in the classroom is is there a difference there and i'll, I'll put that to um to jen first you know some of the resources that you went over is it different doing it in the classroom than doing it at home well each of our our opportunities will have both in person and then those that need to be digital. And in fact, it'll also have elements where parents can be involved as well. So you'll be able to do either or. And even if, like I said, if you're teaching hybrid and you have some kids in the classroom where some are going to be virtual, there are ways that you can be able to connect all of the students. Um, so there's going to be an opportunity to do both. That's great. Um, do any of our other panelists want to pitch into how their lessons might be different? And I have done the same for when we do it directly to teachers. It's a full-fledged lesson plan as well as the uh, hands-on that connects. But when we uh, knew we had to go to 
parents and doing it on, we simplified that. We still gave them some true basic facts connecting within lessons, but simplified it for the parents to be able to easily get the message, the facts across to their children uh, and get it in a simpler version. I know Mary I, and I selected lessons for Seeds to Success that, that we knew we could do in a classroom or at home as well. You can speak a bit more. I, think, that, I think they're very parent friendly. Uh, you know, they're in everyday language. They're actually probably easier, some of them, on the commodities to do at home because you have the uh, you know, the fruits and vegetables readily available or you, and you can walk outside and things like that. So I think they're very, very home learning friendly. Great, thank you. And that actually wraps us up for our education session. We're gonna take a 10 minute break for everybody to um, have a moment to get, uh, get ready for our success story, which will start at 11.05. So uh, leave your computers on, just go around and get a new cup of coffee or something and we will be right back in about 10 minutes. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, thank you everybody. And we're back for our Farm to School Conference, the second session of our third day. We're gonna be uh, covering success stories from around the state today. Uh, we just launched a poll for you all to go ahead and answer. That is, uh, are you currently gardening with kids? And have you ever attended a garden training? Uh, a reminder that you can find all of the resources that you need in your conference program, which you can find a link for in the chat. And we'll go ahead and send that again just to make sure that everybody has access to it. Um, you can find the emails for all of the attendees and all of the resources that they are talking about there. Um, any other thing that we want to tell them before we get started? I think that's, oh, remember that you can ask questions in the Q&A. There's a Q&A function here along with the chat. Go ahead and uh, put whatever questions you want there or raise your hand, whatever you'd like. And we'll be able to answer our Q&A at the end of the session. But with that, we'll go ahead and get started. That was only a one minute intro. <laughs> Do you want me to end one? Um, let's leave the polling up. up. The people in there? Okay, we'll leave it up. Right yeah, now. we'll go ahead and leave the polling up during the, uh, during the session. If you already answered, you can close out of it. We'll, we'll have your answer recorded and we'll show the results at the end there. But uh, thank you all for joining us again or staying during the break or tuning in now. Uh, we will go ahead and share our uh, success stories from around the state. Hi, this is Betsy Johnson. I'm a teacher at St. Mary's Assumption School in Cottonport, Louisiana. And I'm also co-owner of a market garden called Sycamore okay, Acres in my hometown of Cottonport. See behind me is the market garden that we grow year round, my husband and I. Uh, he is the grower of the garden. And some of the plants that we do have here right now are broccoli. We have cauliflower, carrots, beets, various types of lettuces for our salad mix. And we'll be planting pretty soon uh, some other fall varieties. But today, um, I'd really like to talk about sweet potatoes. So what we have lined up at our school this week is a taste test with students from grades pre-K all the way to eighth grade. And they will be ta tasting our sweet potatoes. For this taste test, we had a range of ages from pre-K all the way to eighth grade. So in the planning stages of this taste test, I made a seating arrangement and grouped them by ages and I used four different tables. Okay. What are we doing in the computer lab today? So we are tasting sweet potatoes. How many of you know how sweet potatoes are grown? Charlie. Okay, that, that's pretty good. You're so close. Are they grown above the ground or below the ground? Above the ground. Okay, any, they're actually grown below the ground. I knew it. And what is, your, what is the word? for a sweet potato in the ground. Anybody know? know? It starts with a T. I know. Oh, it starts with a T. Starts with money. A tuber. A potato 
like this is a vegetable that's grown in the ground, underground, under the top of the soil as a tuber. Isn't that cool? Okay, so when we plant sweet potatoes, do you see these little growths? See, you see these little um, shoots coming off this potato? So this is an older potato. We're not going to eat this one. It ha it's growing these little shoots off of them. What we could actually do is cut these off and plant, and them, in plant them in the ground and they will produce sweet potatoes. Okay? Potato. So let's talk about the nutrition around sweet potatoes. So sweet potatoes have some really good vitamins. Okay? One of them is vitamin A. What is vitamin A good for in our bodies? Raise your hand if you know. Vitamin A. Nolan. Before each taste test, I provide some instruction about the vegetable the students will be tasting. I think it's important for them to learn about nutritional facts, growing methods, food preparation, and growing locations. Children need to have an understanding of where their food comes from and all of the health benefits that come with locally grown food. Everything I need to prepare for a taste test is included within the Louisiana Harvest of the Month Compendium of Activities and Lessons on Louisiana Food Products. Included in the compendium are resources that are organized by grade level. Each section contains hyperlinks for literacy materials, printable worksheets and documents, and nutritional and growing facts about each fruit and vegetable recognized as a Harvest of the Month item. Try that one. <laughs> Vitamin C. We also get it from orange juice. When you're sick, yes, yeah, so it helps to fight infection. Very good. Okay. Let's go ahead and taste some sweet potatoes. Okay? So at this point during the taste test, the kids were ready to dive in and taste the sweet potatoes. For this particular lesson, uh, the sweet potatoes were baked and uh, we put a little bit of butter and cinnamon on them. Um, also, it's very important to note that for the taste test, I do get permission from the students' parents to be able to let them participate and be involved. Um, as you notice from the pictures, the kids' faces are just priceless. Some of them love the sweet potatoes, uh, some of them not so much. I think that whether they like them or not, the main goal of the activity is to get them to taste the sweet potatoes. So that way when they go home they can tell their parents that they tried something new and that's what's most important. Um, to try to get them to like new foods and new vegetables, new fruits, um, that's what we're trying to accomplish here with the taste test. So this is a pre-k student who's not too thrilled about tasting the sweet potatoes but he did, he tried it. I also try to teach the kids that whenever they're tasting their vegetable, try not to make a big deal out of it if they don't like it. Um, we don't want that to rub off on somebody else. We, d we want them to form their own opinion about the vegetable. Taste it, and then we're going to vote on if you liked it or if you didn't care for it too much. But listen, what we don't want to do is say, yeah, we don't want to do that. We just want to taste it and be positive about it, okay? If you don't like it, that's okay. I really just want you to taste it and try it, all right? So the younger students, you guys, are going to vote by circling your choice on this little slip of paper, okay? So what you would do is circle it. If you tried it, you put the check. If you liked it, you you circle the smiley face, and if you loved it, you circle the heart, okay? And we'll go over that again. Now, the older students in middle school, you have a digital ballot. So you have a Google form I emailed to you. You can log in, pull up your ballot, your Google form. I don't know if I can get to it. It's gonna look like this. Ms. McKenzie, can you touch that form up there, please? 
And it's going to look like that, so you can vote digitally, okay? We're going to talk about what you thought, okay? So we can also look at, we can also look at um, the results from the middle school, too. So how can we do that? Here we go. Okay. Oh, we had a loved it. Good. Great. Okay. Um, kindergarten. Kindergarten. Give me a thumbs up if you liked it. Good. Give me a thumbs up if you tried it. Give me a thumbs up if you loved it. Good. Okay. Where's um, pre-K? Or th let's go with this table. Give me a thumbs up. Having a little post-activity discussion about the taste test helps to wrap up the activity and let the kids discuss what they thought about the taste test. Let's leave the activity with knowledge of a vegetable that they may have tried for the first time that day. And they also get to take home a worksheet with informational facts about that vegetable and bring it home to share with their family. Inspiration for the taste test really comes from the school garden at St. Mary's. My husband and I teach the kids how to prep the garden, plant and maintain it, and then they get to taste the vegetables that they grow. At our own farmers markets for Sycamore Acres, it's such a joy to see some of the students and their parents come to look at the vegetables and see everything that we've grown and then the students can identify some of those same vegetables that they see in the school garden. It's great to have full support from my principal, Mr. Nathan Laborde, also the teachers and the parents and also the community as well. As the 4-H sponsor for St. Mary's, it's great to use the school garden as a means of service. Sometimes we were able to harvest the vegetables and give to some community members who are not able to come to farmers markets. Um, we also set up student-led farmers markets for teachers and then through Sycamore Acres my husband and I will harvest vegetables, bag them up and bring them to the teachers lounge and let the teachers um, pick and choose what they need for the week um, and that way it gets the vegetables directly to the teachers as well. Thank you for your time today. I'm hoping I was able to give you some ideas for success with your school, Gordon, and also taste tests at your school. And remember, LSU provides so many resources for uh, gardening activities and lessons in the classroom. Hi everyone, my name is Kiki Fontenot. I work at the LSU Ag Center and I'm um, pre-recording this video for you guys today to learn more about our school garden teacher leadership workshops. Uh, this is a joint effort between myself and Drs. Pam Blanchard, Ed Bush, and Carl Motzenbacher. And we were fortunate to get funding from the Department of Education and the Louisiana Farm to School Program to host this workshop for three summers in a row. And it's really geared towards school teachers. Doesn't matter if you're science, math, history, art, librarian, whatever. Any of you guys who work with kids in schools and you're very interested in also growing a garden with students. So let's tell you a little bit about the workshop and a little bit about why we think gardening is important. And I feel with this first slide, I'm kind of speaking to the choir here, because if you're listening on this and you're in this farm to school conference, you already think gardening is valuable with students. And we know that when students do interact in the soil with gardens, right, they have extra knowledge retention, their science literacy math scores increase in classrooms. We've seen studies and conducted studies ourselves where we've seen their environmental awareness increases, so they're more likely to recycle, to shut off water while brushing teeth, um, pick up trash, things of that nature. Uh, and we've also seen that students who participate in gardens are more likely to eat a wide variety of fruits and vegetables than those who do not participate in gardens. So 
this is all interesting, wonderful, great things that we want our students to be doing, right? One of the major setbacks in school gardens is having a dedicated teacher. And a lot of times there are dedicated teachers. We've been working with school gardens now, or at least I have for 11 plus years, okay? And what we're looking at is having a teacher who can be there year after year after year, really engaging with these students in the garden. Sometimes teachers just get pulled from their classrooms and go from being third grade teacher to ninth grade teacher, right? Because of needs of the school or go from being the librarian to now being the math and social studies teacher. And we can't really, uh, we can't really <clears throat> always, we have a hard time maybe knowing when those things are gonna happen. But if you feel comfortable in the garden, then it's easier to continue gardening with students even when your job details change, right? So with this, less or not this lesson but this series of workshops does is really try to engage the teachers in the school garden make y'all feel more comfortable teaching this material to students and help you guys see how it can be integrated into more than just one type of curriculum because we know that happy teachers make for happy students and when you feel comfortable and when you feel good doing something your students will feel comfortable and good doing it as well so what is this workshop what is it all about we take five consecutive days in the summertime and we cover four horticulture top or five horticulture topics in the morning and five education topics or curriculum topics in the afternoon we're tying those horticulture concepts to all the different types of curriculum in the afternoons when you attend our workshops you get three ceu credits for every section that you attend so if you attend a morning session, that's three. If you attend morning and afternoon on the Monday, that's six. So if you attend both morning and afternoon sessions for all five days, that's a total of 30 continuing education credits you can earn. We've already conducted this workshop for two summers and our next and final round, so you guys really wanna get in on this, is gonna be held May 31st through June 4th, a Monday through Friday in 2020. Okay, and it's going to be held on LSU's campus at the um, Hill Farm Teaching Facility, which is right next to the Lod Cook Alumni Hotel and the LSU Recreational Center. And we have a really great time and we're going to tell you more about it. So the morning sessions are always the horticulture sessions. We try to do those outside in case it's kind of hot. We can do the curriculum parts indoors afterwards. We talk about different means of building raised beds irrigation techniques, how to install irrigation and what kind of irrigation is going to be best for your school garden. We look at insect weeds, weed and disease management, remembering that it's not necessarily just organic management, but no spray management that we're very interested in in school gardens because kids can't always read. We can't just go spraying things, whether they're organic or synthetic. We look at growing vegetables, herbs, fruits, um, native plants, pollinator plants, flowers in the garden. We really mix it up in this in this course. We look at a lot of composting and fertility management. So how to fertilize, when to fertilize, what do you fertilize with, how do you compost, and even um, creating your own vermiculture bin for your own classroom so you can get the worms to help you out. And we love pollinators, pollinator gardens, and native plants. So we go into a lot of details about that as well. So here's just a few pictures from some of our more recent workshops that you can see uh, actual teachers participating with us in the garden. We want you, when you attend this series of workshops with us, to wear comfortable clothes, tennis shoes. Do not worry about makeup or no makeup or how you look. It's all about getting dirty with us. So you can see we go out to the garden. We look at different crops. How and when do you harvest those crops? Where are the insects hiding on these crops? Are these insects good or bad? We plant seeds. We build raised beds. We get really dirty. We don't just build wooden raised beds like most people have, but we build pallet gardens and metal raised beds. And we look at hay bale gardening and all kinds of different things. And y'all, a benefit or a bonus of attending this workshop is that lots of these supplies end up in the trunk of your car and going home with you. So not only are you getting the knowledge, but you're taking a lot of tools home with you as well. We love to propagate in this workshop. So lots of seed propagation, of course, and that's easy to do with students. But we also want you to share with students that you can take and replicate plants from leaves, from roots, and from stems. So we look at just using certain parts of the plant to multiply that plant out into 100, 500 different types of, or different plants from just one. 
So we do a lot of propagation in here. Not only do we propagate, we show you guys how to graft. So we look at that vegetable grafting and why it's important. And we graft tomatoes onto peppers, tomatoes onto eggplant, peppers onto eggplant, eggplant onto eggplant, tomatoes onto tomatoes. You get the picture, right? So we show you how to splice together plants, wrap them back up, bandage them, and you get one more superior plant. So we really want you guys to attend this with us. We really like talking about insects. The good and the bad. If you look over on the left hand side of your screen, you're going to see some gentlemen um, playing with Play Doh and building the ladybug or the lady beetle life cycle. So we talk about metamorphosis. We talk about plant, I mean, sorry, um, insect parts and how that helps them become better pollinators. And we look at capturing insects in our school gardens and means that maybe reduce that insect population, but also allows us to study what's out there with our students. So you can see in the top right hand corner, you've got Ed Bush holding a leaf blower and one of our teacher participants holding a large yellow uh, poster board. And you can see down below, we took those poster boards and we smeared them with Vaseline all the way across. And we walked through various gardens at the Hill Farm and blew the air across the plants and saw what insects got stuck to our sticky traps. And we looked at those using microscopes and scopes on the rope. So it's really cool for your students to kind of engage in some of these neat activities that we can show you how to do. Beneficials are a huge deal for us. Not all insects are bad. So while we do talk about controlling bad insects, we also want to bring in certain insects that are good for us, such as the mason bee. So you guys are going to create mason bee houses and bring them back to your school gardens like you see here, the little blue house with the yellow stars on it. We teach you how to mimic insect behavior, as you can see in the right hand corner, and, and pollinate certain crops. We give you guys tons of pollinator plants so that you can go home with everything you need to plant a butterfly, hummingbird garden in your school. The, that's basically a, a, a very brief rundown of the horticulture sections in the morning. We go into a lot more details on um, weed management, disease, et cetera. But in the afternoon, what we're trying to do is take some of those concepts from the morning and apply them using grade level expectations or um, education standards to typical curriculum that most of our kids are going to see, whether they're elementary or high school, such as science and engineering, art and reading, history, social studies, PE, health and nutrition, math and agriculture, and even languages. So what we look at our geography, for instance, in the garden, and we look at orienting the students with um, east, west, north, and south using birdhouses. We look at recycling activities and making seed cards with seeds. We look at various computer-based programs like Herman the Worm, and we look at how you can take that, that vermiculture bin and do actual lessons and quizzes and really, base, and really understand worm anatomy with it using the computer and your students. We look at linguistics in the garden. So we like to do a lot of um, painted rocks. Rocks you can keep out in the garden during all types of weather. And we paint words on them on the front in English, sometimes on the back, as you can see here in Thai. We have a grad student who's helped some of our teachers convert them to French and even Spanish. And we look at using these with our students to build haikus or different um, poetry or just sentence structure, just making a complete sentence. So some of our rocks may have words. Um, we try to have a number of nouns, verbs, adjectives, um, transition type words. And we also look at having punctuation. So we put a comma on a rock or an exclamation point or a question mark or a period so that students can properly construct those sentences in the garden. All of the things that you guys are gonna do in this great workshop are gonna be ready to go back to your classroom with you. So when we build compost bins or vermiculture bins or the mason bee houses, you take that home with you. All the lessons and all the activities are printed for you and given to you on a jump drive. We really want you to be able to use this as soon as you get back into the classroom and be a successful garden teacher. So far, our participants have really enjoyed these past two workshops. Um, Lots of teachers like the fact that we do hold it in early summer, so it's a great time of year. You don't have to miss out on work. Um, lots of people have said that they feel very prepared for the school garden. Everything was great. Best training they've ever attended. Awesome is a word that gets spoken over and over and over. On our last series, y'all, um, even during COVID, even wearing masks the whole time, the last day of our workshop, all the teachers were gathered up in the parking lot. We were loading up cars with more supplies, 
and it's like they didn't want to leave. They kept wanting to talk or rehash things we had done or give more ideas on things we could do. And it was a really great group of teachers. You guys, we try to make it fun. We eat lunch together. It's brown bag style. Um, some of our teachers bring in little special drinks like we had smashed blackberries and um, homemade lemonades this year. We, we make it personable and really enticing for you. And I think you guys would love joining us for this workshop. Remember, it's May 31st through June 4th this year, 2021 on LSU's campus. We would love to have you join us. If you're interested in joining us, just give me an email, kkfontenot, F-O-N-T-E-N-O-T, -E at agcenter.lsu.edu, and we will get you registered to join us for this great teacher leadership workshop. If you guys have any questions, I'll be on the live session later on in the day, and I'm here to answer those for you. Hope you have a great one. Hi, my name is Ainsley Amer, and I'm going to be talking to you about growing gardens at Iberville Elementary School. Myself, Michelle Daigle, Cindy Jofreon, and Carrie Callaghan have worked on this project. I'm going to give you a little background knowledge before we get started. I work at a public Montessori school in Plaquemine, Louisiana, and in the Montessori curriculum, we keep our kids for three years. So my, a lot of my kids come to me as three-year-olds and I keep them until they are five and going on, or five and six going on to first grade. At Iberville Elementary, um, we have nine pre-K kindergarten classrooms and we received the Growing Garden Grant two years in a row. The Going, Growing Garden Grant has given us six waste beds, lots of seeds, dirt, an irrigation system, and a wealth of knowledge. We have used the Louisiana Home Vegetable Gardening book that we received from the grant to do a lot of our gardening and research and knowing when to plant. The pre-K department saw our gardens and decided to fence in our outside areas in order for our children to be able to work inside, outside all day long. Um, we also received a greenhouse, but unfortunately our greenhouse was destroyed by the maintenance personnel at our school, so we're hoping it will be fixed soon. Once we realize, once they put the fence up, we realized that we wanted a few more raised beds in our different areas throughout the, um, the pre-K kindergarten building. So we added three more long skinny raised beds along our fence line in order to put vegetables that are going to vine. The kids help plant, weed, and maintain the gardens. A lot of our kids stay with us for three years, so this is something that the kids come back to year after year. They look forward to working in our garden. We are very fortunate that right outside our back door is our, we have a cart yard with our gardens in it, so the kids can access them all day long, and they take ownership of it. This is their garden, and they want it to look good, and they want it, they want their flowers and their vegetables to look nice. Gardening teaches responsibility, ownership, routine, and collaboration. This is one of my kindergarten students. He has been with me for three years. And when he first started out, he really had a hard time expressing his words and his thoughts and verbalizing it to us. And the garden has really helped him. He, and not only does it calm him, it relaxes him, but he goes out there and he has ownership of it. This is his flower. This is his area where he plants. And he also works with others in order to maintain the garden area for all students. So he planted this flower when we first started um, this year, and he has watered it and he's watched it grow. He's learned the different parts of this sunflower, and he was really excited to see how, that it was almost as tall as him. So we took out our measuring tape and we measured it, and then we measured him, we compared, we contrasted, and we were able to integrate different subjects into our garden, which is our ultimate goal. So he is very excited about this flower. He comes out every day, he waters it, he maintains it, he takes care of it. It's his, it's ownership to him, and it makes him very happy.
Our garden is a living, breathing educational tool. In this picture, we have a little girl. She's a three year, a four year old that's returning, and a little boy. He's a three year old. It's his first year with us. Well, he's never seen a cucumber plant before. He did not know that cucumbers came from plants that were planted in the ground. He said that he's been to the store and he's eat, seen cucumbers and he's eaten cucumbers, but he didn't know how where they came from. So I took this plant and I showed him the teeny tiny cucumbers that were growing with the little flowers that are growing at the end. And I explained to him that these cucumbers are gonna grow and they're gonna grow and they're gonna get much bigger and then we can eat them. I then explained to him that in order for these cucumbers to grow, we need to add lots of water and it needs lots of sunlight. So this was a wonderful learning opportunity to integrate the knowledge he had from going to the store and eating cucumbers at home and seeing how they were actually made. Here we have Miss Cindy Jofreon helping one of her students to water his kale. They just planted kale for our winter fall garden. And we also have another student who's watering independently by herself. Kids in our multi-age classes help each other. The younger students learn from the older students. So in our picture, we have a group of three students on your left-hand side, two kindergarten and one pre-K. And the kindergarten girl is actually showing the little boy how to water the plants, how to carry the bucket, how not to overwater them. They're collaborating together to work on their garden. On your right-hand side, you can see Miss Cindy is showing two new three-year-old pre-K boys how to water our garden. The students can taste their harvest. We use this as a learning opportunity. So this past fall, winter, we planted some lettuce and the kids really loved that they were able to cut the lettuce with scissors. But then we took it to another level. What we did was we allowed them to taste the lettuce and then we gave them each a block and we put a smiley face, a sad face, and then a, like a, I didn't try it face or an X out kind of thing. And we let them vote. We made a graph out of it. We allowed them to vote if they liked it, they didn't like it, or if they didn't even want to try it. And this brought in math. This allowed them to visually see that and we were able to count and compare the, the likes, the dislikes, and the kids that didn't even try it. We always use our garden as a way to integrate different learning opportunities, both in the classroom, in our garden, combined. Our kiddos really love their garden and they're always excited when veggies are ready to harvest. Um, we planted some carrots and some radishes this past fall and those by far have been the biggest hit. The kids think it's the coolest thing when they just pull it out of the ground and all of a sudden at the top, it looked like a weed, but at the bottom, you got a vegetable. They really enjoyed tasting the radishes and having a new flavor. So we got to use some new vocabulary words to describe the flavor of the radishes, to describe what they smelled like. It, would, it brought in a whole new taste for a lot of these kids. This is something they really look forward to. You know, they watch as their carrots grow and they go out the garden every day and they look to see if they're ready. And we tell them, okay, you got, they gotta get at least this tall before you can pull them. And then when they get to pull them and they come in the classroom and they show it to you, it's just, it's great. Their faces are just lit up with joy and excitement. And it's an amazing feeling that we can provide this for our students. Hello, my name is Angelina Harrison. I'm the Director of Markets for Market Umbrella, and we'll be talking to you today about our Farm to School program, Harvesting for Health in Louisiana. A little bit of information about us. Uh, Market Umbrella is the New Orleans nonprofit that runs the Crescent City Farmers Market. We're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. Uh, Pre-COVID, we ran six weekly farmers markets in two parishes and a host of fresh food incentive programs, including 
uh, our Market Match program, which doubles SNAP dollars spent at the market, and Market Mamas supporting breastfeeding mothers on WIC. Now during COVID, we've pivoted our operations and programs. We're currently running a home delivery box, two contactless drive-through markets, and a modified walk-up market. I'll take you through a few of the changes that we've had to make to farm to school activities due to COVID um, as we move through the presentation. Market Umbrella has operated our Meet Me at the Market field trip program since 2011, working to connect Orleans Parish students to local agriculture and food producers through our market. We've developed curriculum for pre-K through fifth grade, and the way it works is that our staff visits a participating classroom with lessons on nutrition, food production, um, food economics, et cetera, whatever might tie into what the kids are learning about. The following day, students come to visit the market and are guided through activities like tastings and scavenger hunts. All students then take home a small tote filled with produce, recipes, um, activities, and information to continue the experience at home. Through this work, we became the Louisiana State Lead for the National Farm to School Network in 2017. Uh, working to build the Farm to School Network within our state, we connected with a local school, school food uh, service management company that was looking to integrate local sourcing. After some successes in connecting them to local growers, we pursued a USDA Farm to School Implementation Grant, which we were awarded in 2018. Thus, Harvesting for Health was born. For the past couple of years through this program, we've been working to help Orleans Parish primary public schools to implement all three components of Farm to School, so curriculum, school gardens, and procurement. And uh, on the supply side, we've also been working with producers to get ready to meet institutional demand. As a farmer's market organization, this really allowed us to marry our existing field trip programming with the goal of supporting our network of local growers through connecting them to and creating new sales opportunities with schools. It's taken a village and our long list of partners includes the seven schools uh, that we partner with along with Sprout NOLA, the LSU Ag Centers, Farm to School, Food Safety and Extension Services, Southern University, three farmer partners, Volunteers for America's Fresh Food Factor, Dijon's Catering, and the Healthy School Food Collaborative in Orleans Parish uh, School Food Authority. For year one of teacher training, we partnered with Sprout NOLA, a local nonprofit <clears throat> that runs garden training for teachers, uh, community gardens, producer technical assistance, and more um, to offer a series of classes to a team of teachers from each participating school. The second year, we teamed up with LSU Ag Center's School Garden Boot Camp. Um, this partnership created a very rich curriculum with a focus on both the agricultural side from Anna Timmerman and Joe Willis, the Orleans Parish Extension agents, and Sprout uh, brought to the table the community building and curriculum integration side. We also connected every participating school to Crystal Bessie and the LSU Ag Center's Harvest of the Month resources. Physical materials were brought to team kickoff meetings, including the Harvest of the Month toolkits, uh, multiple physical copies of all the HOM posters and um, the lesson compendium. There was a big spectrum <clears throat> of garden condition across our partner schools and Sprout helped each school build a custom garden plan through the teacher training and then organize build outs. We had a number of those build outs scheduled for this past spring, uh, which COVID interfered with. Um, we have received an extension for the grant and hope things can uh, normalize to the point where we can complete them this coming spring. Pictured here is the amazing garden space at Mildred Osborne Charter School in the East, which we did help to complete. With procurement, um, our goal was to forge a few meaningful and manageable partnerships with food service management companies. And so we worked to onboard schools who had a, um, food service management companies in common. We'd originally thought that, like we had previously done in our procurement work, we'd analyze menus, see what was purchased regularly to compare that to local availability, looking for items available in the right volume and consistency at the right price, and working through delivery and other logistics. Um, but we found that with our new partners, an audience, uh, it was an audience largely unfamiliar with local seasonality, and so a calendar of availability was more useful. So what we did was compile a list of the vendors interested in wholesaling to schools, um, verified their on-farm food safety practices, then indicated all of the products that they'd be interested in selling in volume, uh, their price ranges and expected seasonal availability in this one list with a snapshot here. 
we also included information like the farm name, uh, location and growing practices, just to share as much information as possible with potential buyers and um, start that relationship. Uh, then we'd share with stakeholders uh, whenever there were updates to it. We also found it a useful tool for other institutional um, sales conversations and used it to facilitate initial conversations between buyers and sellers as a starting point. And uh, finally, the gap training. Uh, well, it is a common misconception that producers must have good agricultural practices or gap certification in order to sell to schools. Oftentimes, conventional distributors require the certification to satisfy insurance requirements. We figured that while we were working to connect producers directly to schools, we'd also work to increase gap certification so that a grower could take a conventional route to the schools um, and also just increase the number of gap certified growers in the state. With Professor Adhikari and his team at the LSU Ag Center, we coordinated a PSA training and gap workshop in New Orleans for our grower partners that was also open to the public. There we connected our grower partners with a food safety specialist from Southern University to give individualized assistance to help them finalize and implement the farm food safety plans and um, prepare for a gap audit. COVID has thrown a bit of a wrench in this timeline as well, um, which was supposed to culminate this past spring. But with the extension that we're getting, we're um, getting the ball rolling on that again and hoping to get these growers um, added to the GAP certified roster by next spring. I did want to share one um, procurement highlight. To celebrate Farm to School Month in October of last year, we brought the idea of doing the Great Louisiana Satsuma Appeal to some of our schools and food service management companies. Um, that was something that the Pennington Biomedical Research Center had started at the Farm to School Conference, I believe in uh, 2018. We all peeled and ate a local Satsuma together and celebrated with a sticker, which of course we all know children love, um, to introduce a farm to school monthly acti uh, month activity um, during October. We thought it would be a great project for schools to take on and right off the bat, there was just tons of excitement. The partner schools were 100% on board. Um, food service management companies found it relatively easy to implement this single event, um, sometimes as a snack for an item that basically you know, needed no prep, was relatively shelf stable, and happens to come in the exact uh, portion size a fruit needs to, um, to, be, uh, to meet nutritional requirements for school lunch. Um, in fact, the food service management companies started onboarding other schools that they were servicing beyond our partner schools, and then we reached out to Edible Schoolyard schools thinking they might be interested, and uh, they were. Each school set their own celebration date where every student would peel and eat a satsuma together. We provided some language for them to use to celebrate the peel and stickers for each student um, to receive and then delivered them to the various participating schools. You can see the logo that we used pictured here, borrowed from Pennington. Um, we printed them as a die cut sticker. So each sticker was the shape of Louisiana, which was super cute. Um, and ultimately, we had 16 schools participate with almost 9,000 children in Orleans Parish eating a satsuma with their classmates last year. In conclusion, we have learned so much. Um, it really takes a village, you know, of both programmatic partners, leads within the school and the school's community um, to really get things off the ground and keep them moving. Also, uh, when you're opening the door to procurement, the USDA's micro purchasing allowance is a really great tool. Uh, it allows food service um, companies to purchase smaller amounts without bidding them out so they can, you know, kind of test the waters of local procurement. Also, uh, many myths surround farm to school work and they accumulate to the point where people think that it's harder than it is. Uh, be prepared to say over and over that gap certification is not required, that small farmers can produce the volume needed and be price competitive, um, that kids can learn to eat vegetables. Sometimes you find surprisingly easy solutions. During the Satsuma Peel um, planning, for example, we found that BOA, a food service management company, was sourcing from a local per, uh, distributor who actually offered local Satsumas. However, for some reason, they were not on their approved list. So BOA made the request to approve that item. Now Capital City can freely sell Star Nursery Satsumas to BOA whenever they want them. All the pieces were there, they just had to be connected. And um, finally, when you're bringing a new idea like farm to school to the table, a lot of it is about um, changing minds. 
you'll need to find ways to expose the various participants over and over and over again until it seems normal and possible. It's a systems changing thing and not done overnight. Uh, relationships and relationship forming is absolutely critical. Uh, again, Angeline Harrison with uh, Market Umbrella, thank you so much for your time today and please do not hesitate to reach out. Okay, and we are back. All right, so let me invite all of our panelists back in to uh, answer and ask questions. One moment. So we're going to be joined by Kiki Fontenot, Ainsley A. Bear, uh, Dr. Hudson Jen, um, Betsy Johnson. Unfortunately, is not with us today. And did you guys get Right, so that should be all of us. We had a lot of questions come in for this session. Um, so let's see. Alessandro, do you want to start with the question first? Yeah, sure. Uh, Ms. Ainsley, we had a couple of questions for you. Uh, one of the questions was, how were you able to convince the school administration to let you continue with the program after all the problems you have had, especially with the greenhouse getting destroyed? Well, we're very fortunate that our principal believes in our program and she sees the benefit in us being able to teach them not only in the classroom, but also in the outside environment. It's an extension of our classroom. So we're basically able to show her like, look, our children are learning to read and write and do math through our garden. So it kind of it helps us to continue to push forward. And whenever she sees the kids, the cute pictures of the kids with the produce, she has a hard time telling us no. So Perfect. Another question that was asked was um, the products you harvest in the garden. What do you do with those? Are you selling them at a local market or are you using them in the school cafeteria or what, what else could you do with those? So right now we don't have that much produce, but the produce that we do have, the children have snack during the day and they prepare it themselves. So our kids will peel the vegetables and cut them up, wash them and have the snack. So they'll either eat the snack in the classroom or we'll present it to the other classes so like we can share. We can't really share as much with COVID, but usually we, if we have extras, we share out to the classes. Um, I wish we had enough to share throughout the school, but our school is really big. So we're able to share within our, um, our grade level if we have extras. And then the kids also take them home. They love taking their stuff home. Oh, okay. Nice. We have a lot of other questions as well. Um, I know there was one right off the bat for Kiki earlier about um, when the next school garden session is, and also if you are allowed to attend the school garden leadership training, um, if you have already done the growing gardens training. Okay, so the answer is yes, you can. You can attend both. The trainings are separate, and they've got a lot of very different material in them, so it would not um, be weird at all to attend the teacher leadership conference if you've already done the Growing Gardens program. Um, and the next teacher leadership workshop is going to be May 31st through June 4th, um, 2021. So this summer, it's like basically it's the first week of June, right? It's just Monday happens to fall on the last day of, of May. So it's those five days. And it's going to be at the Hill Farm Teaching Facility on LSU's campus. And if you guys are interested, um, we haven't opened up our uh, Qualtrics survey to apply for it quite yet, just because it is so far in, in, in the future. But if you want to get your name on a list and make sure I send you that link to fill out that survey, you can email me anytime before starting today, you know, just send me an email, but make sure um, in the title of the email or in like the subject line, you just say teacher leadership conference. So it really stands out to me. Right. And I also just wanted to point out that we just uh, shared our poll results for the question we asked earlier. Are you currently gardening with kids? And it looks like 39% of our attendees are currently gardening with kids. 29 are not, 29% that is, and 32% are not, but they're interested in learning more. Um, as far as who has ever attended a garden training, 58% of our attendees have. 27% uh, have not, but want to learn more. And 15% just said no. So that's uh, some background there for you, Kiki, of our attendees. 
Um, Angelina, we had a question, and I believe it got answered in the in the chat or in the Q and A. But it was about um, top box foods and if they are involved with Market Umbrella and Farm to School with you. Um, we are continually deepening our relationship with top box. I'm just going over the list in my mind of things that we're doing with them now. Um, but Farm to School is not one of them. I don't know. I don't think that Farm to School is really a component of their work. Um, but it could be an interesting uh, conversation. We work with them on a community food project and also on a um, Gus Nip uh, nutrition incentive project. Well, yeah, well, see, I had a question. Let's say a school wanted to do harvest of the month and they wanted to source cucumbers. Could Top Box conceivably facilitate that? Conceivably, yes. Yeah. All right, uh, Dr. Hudson, do you have any questions for our speakers? Uh, yes, uh, I have a question and anyone can uh, jump in on that. Um, I, it sounds like there's a lot of learning that takes place with the school gardens. I was wondering if any of our uh, panelists know how many students or any idea if students then go home and help their families establish a garden at home? Yeah. I guess I'll jump in. I don't know the exact number. That would be a really good uh, research question and you know, really interesting to find that out. And, and Ansley or Angelina, you know, may want to jump in on this one too. But I know, like, just with my personal experience working with schools around the state, I do get a lot of feedback from especially the younger kids going home and trying to start a school garden there. So, like, it may not be, I mean, not a school, but a home garden. It may not be. Um, what we do is like a big raised bed or an in-ground garden, but, you know, just bringing home some of the extra plants. A lot of times if the schools, like we'll, we'll plant 50 cucumbers and like Ansley said, you have six raised beds. You don't need 50 cucumbers, you know? <laughs> the kids take it home, they can uh, plant it just in a pot on their back porch or on their balcony. And so we get a lot of that feedback um, back to us just saying like, the teacher's like, oh, uh, Johnny, Mary, and Sue all have, you know, extra plants growing at their house now. And their mama said that they had a garden, so they started one over there, too. And it's not just maybe where they live, but they talk about it to their relatives. And, you know, they might have a cucumber at mama's house and their house. So I don't know how to quantify that number, but it's definitely something I'd say I hear from at least 40 to 50% of the teachers that we interact with on a, on a regular basis that we get that kind of talk coming back to us. So it definitely influences the establishment of home gardens then. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a question to all panelists from one of our attendees. John Green is asking if it is possible to have some Satsuma delivered to, deliver to a school since they're going virtual. They are at Impact Charter in Baker, Louisiana. So I don't know if that becomes a crystal question, but they're looking for how can we get Satsumas to our school? So they, they want to know if they can get uh, Satsumas delivered to a home or to the school. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, since the students are going virtual, I don't know if the school would then deliver it to them uh, with maybe some type of lunch program like with three o'clock project does or um, I, I'm not sure. Well, I, I know that the, the students that are going virtual in a district will um, they have the option to go pick up lunches at their at their school. And so that falls back at the school district level. They can purchase the satsumas and then put them in those bagged lunches or box, lunch, box lunches that the kids come pick up. Um, so yes, you can still, you, um, as long as your school district is participating or the, uh, you know, you can have the principal request that, that your school get the satsumas for the Great Louisiana Satsuma Appeal or um, talk to your cafeteria manager or you can also talk to um, your district level. And, and if anyone needs help with that, you guys are welcome to email me. I'm, I would be happy to help facilitate that and try to get some Satsumas in your schools um, for the Satsuma appeal or anytime. Um, and my email is cbesse at agcenter.lsu.edu. Thanks, Crystal. We have two more quick ones. I think this one is for Ainsley, but maybe also for Kiki too, they're asking, is drip irrigation used in school gardens? 
Yes, ma'am. Um, I was fortunate enough to rece receive a drip irrigation system from the, um, the grant from LSU. And so we've used it and it's really helped a lot. I actually was able to keep my summer garden going because we had this system. So I just came check on it during COVID when I could and things kept growing. So it was kind of cool. The kids could kind of see that when they came back, we still had stuff. Thanks. And Kiki, I'm sure that's something that you probably recommend to the schools that you work with is the drip irrigation instead of like hand watering. Yes, um, we like to, with all the, the Growing Gardens grant students, we make sure that they have a timer and um, soaker hoses. Um, it's not traditional drip irrigation where, you know, you think of the emitters and the plastic tubing. And that's just because typically you need really long grows or you need a large area so that you're not you know breaking those pipes but soaker hoses we use and that's just a, a great bmp for school gardens is to always water at the base of the plants so if you're not using drip you know try to use a um a watering can or something where you can get down at the base of the plant right because you don't want to wet the foliage if at all possible to reduce disease you want to water at the root so all right well we are uh, officially out of time we are at noon and it is time for the end of the conference so there was one question is there a cost kiki for a school garden workshop for the teacher leadership workshop there is um a dollar fee to it and your a lot of our teachers have um, their schools write the check back for that leadership workshop right okay and they can find more information about the leadership workshop i believe we have a link in our program for that so if they're looking for more info just go through the conference program go to the um, success story page and you can find information there but that wraps up our day three out of four for the 2020 virtually everywhere louisiana farm to school conference so join us again tomorrow at 10 a.m we'll have two more exciting sessions on um Louisiana Heritage in the Cafeteria, as well as uh, Farm to School in the Food System, and followed up with our, another virtual taste test on broccoli. So um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email us, share the conference link with your friends. Thank you so much to our speakers for joining us, for putting those videos together and joining for live Q&A, and again to our steering committee for helping us put all this together. Um, but that about closes us out for the day. I think that's all, right? Mm -hmm. See you guys tomorrow at 10 a.m. Bye, everybody.